in the uh, Evergetinus, um, there are ser several sections. The book's divided into sections. They have a title, and then they have uh, examples uh, explaining the title. And tonight's title, which I found this week, is, and I'll read this to you, it says, The joy of heaven is inexpressible, as is the glory which awaits the saints. Therefore, we must remember with our whole soul the joy of heaven and the glory of the saints. In all we accomplish, nothing is equal to that glory. In all we accomplish, nothing is, a, is equal to that glory. And then the section goes on to, to uh, quote various saints. And the first saint is actually uh, Mother Sinclaitiki, uh, who was a nun, a uh, hermitess, um, well, not exactly a hermit, because she did have some uh, people with her. Uh, she, in fact, she, she had a sister who was blind, and so she lived with her. But she was a, a, from a very rich family, and she gave away, gave away her wealth and settled um, outside of Alexandria in uh, some sort of um, crypt. Don't know the details, but that's not important. This is 4th century, and she died in 350. This is wisdom of her age today, very important. And she says that we find ourselves um, as though in a second womb. The first womb is obviously embryonic state, in which we're all born inside our mother's womb, we're born there. In that state, we are fed by the mother, we cannot feed for ourselves, we cannot go and eat solid foods or banquets. But And, and also, in the womb, we do not see the sun. It's darkness. That is the first womb, which is embryonic stage. We, everybody knows that. The second is the womb of this world. In this, this womb, we have sunlight. There is light, but it's nothing compared with heavenly light. It's not the same thing. So though we think we, we you know, this is a, some sort of progress, I suppose, in a sense, of growing and then being able to see the sunshine. We can eat solid foods. We can enjoy all the riches of the earth, earthly things. This is in the second womb, but it is not of the heavenly. And as we live in the second womb, as it were, we need to be thinking about the glory of the saints and the joy of heaven, which is awaiting everyone. That's what we should be thinking about. One of the fathers said that if you think about it all the time, you will be there. You'll end up there because you're thinking about it. Now, obviously, that's a little bit deeper than just the saying. We have to think about the one, to meditate on that. We do not enjoy wondrous delights which are found excess, uh, sorry, exclusively in the kingdom of heaven. So though we enjoy the sunshine, like today with this beautiful weather, um, the scenery around us, um, we are well fed, we don't, we don't starve. It's nothing, nothing compared with the heavenly kingdom, which is being prepared for us. So why would we spend most of our time being worried about this world? Why? We need to think of the next world that is to come. And it's, uh, Mother Sinclaitiki says we now have to develop an, at, uh, we, sorry, we all have appetite for earthly things, let us develop appetite for heavenly things. Now we can do this uh, through prayer, in the presence of God, especially liturgy. I think that is a glimpse, that is a glimpse of heaven. Just a little glimpse, but that is there. And so that's, we should have an appetite for services, for liturgy. We should have an appetite for prayer. It is said that, you know, prayer, you have to develop a taste for prayer. When one does, it becomes sweet. It doesn't become the chore or the hard time that we have trying to pray and concentrate. It becomes natural. And I think the only way to achieve that is by constant prayer. So always praying as you work and move around and you drive. And whatever you do remembrance of God and that will also be remembrance of the kingdom 
which is to come. Yet, in a sense, it's here already, of course. Let us develop an appetite for heavenly things. And she goes on to say, just as babies develop slowly inside the mother, and then, as mature organisms, come into full life and enjoy the diets of wide variety, so to the righteous, the saints, since they have been made perfect by their earthly behavior, conduct, depart for the heavenly state. And he quotes from the Psalms, that she quotes from the Psalms, from strength to strength. The opposite is darkness. The opposite of, of thinking about the heavenly kingdom and, and preparing ourselves for this fantastic journey, the opposite is death. It is darkness. To spend the rest of our life in darkness, spiritual darkness. St. Maximus the Confessor says that you need to go, go to your bedroom, close the door, cut out all the light and sit. And that is an example of what darkness is and what it will be that is eternal. The thought of that. On a practical level, try it and see how long you can last before you get bored. Maybe four minutes, five minutes. Unless you fall asleep and it doesn't count. We need stimulation. You go crazy without it and trying to live in darkness. And you can imagine how in the, if we don't contemplate the beauty of heaven that we're going to be stuck in this room in darkness for eternity. It doesn't bear thinking about. But that is the opposite. So Machimus says that we are born three times. First is from a mother's womb, natural birth. And the second is baptism, Christiania. In, in the Salon is Pakabitiya, which means rebirth, born again. That's the second. So the first one is natural birth, which we all, all experience. The second one is Christiania, baptism, which we have experienced. I don't think anybody here hasn't. But the third is repentance. That's the third birth. And it is a way of preparing. When we repent, we are continually thinking about the kingdom of heaven. And so it comes back to the joy of heaven is inexpressible as is the glory which awaits the saints. In all we accomplish, nothing is equal to that glory. That is what is pre being prepared for us now. This is a wonderful gift from God. And so Mac I quote here uh, from St. Maximus. My brothers and sisters, the glory which the saints, and I would say here faithful, are to enjoy is great and incomprehensible. While the glory of this life on earth is like a perishable flower. You know that you, you pluck a flower and you put it in a vase and it looks beautiful, and, and then, but it eventually withers, wilts, dies. And that's what this life is like and the pleasures of it. And I'm sure many of us have experienced the, the disappointments when we think this is just what we need to do in this world, and it isn't. Or it doesn't last, does it? The glory of this life on earth is like a perishable flower. And so Maximus goes on to say, where, oh no, that's, sorry, this is actually St. Ephraim the Syrian, saying, where is the glory of the Sumerians? Where is the glory of Egypt? It's gone. We have the monuments, we have these amazing uh, pyramids, carvings, that we, and the tombs of the pharaohs is wonderful, but where is the glory of Egypt? It's gone. It doesn't last. Sumerians, Persians, great empire. You're coming from Georgia, you know about the Persians. Gone. It's gone. Hittites. I mentioned them because I discovered recently that was an amazing civilization. Not many people know, know anything about it, but they're beginning to discover more. Highly uh, civilized, educated. Where is it? Also, Hittite people would probably say today. 
They built to the kings of these various empires. They built tombs. And then the next invaders came along, destroyed the tombs, threw the, threw the bones away, built their own tombs, built their own cities. I'm thinking of, of uh, Seljuk Turks who came from, from the east, from, from Mongolia. When they moved into the area of uh, Ephesus, for example, they didn't destroy, uh, they, well, when I say destroy, they like to borrow bricks. So if they wanted to build a house, they would just find the nearest one that was old and demolish it and use the brick. They were great builders, actually, Seljuk Turks. Interesting um, architecture. Where are they today? Gone. Where is the glory of the Seljuk Empire, which was so in the in the eleventh century, or two centuries? I think it's just three centuries. Gone. And what did the modern Turks do? They destroyed destroyed the buildings because they needed the materials. This is earthly kingdoms. Where are they? St. Maximus, um, to come back to St. Maximus, he says there are three, three notions of the kingdom of heaven. The first one is it's a dwelling place of the worthy. So heaven is where the righteous go and, and live with God. And the second is an angelic. Some people see it as, this is different views, all right? The first one is, is it is where the worthy go. The second is an angelic state. So we live like angels. I remember when I was brought up as a child, we, we were taught this pitch of uh, you go and sit on a cloud and, and play a, the harp. And I thought that was a really terrible future <laughs> when I played the violin, but it doesn't matter. But seriously, it's, you know, that's the child's view. I think it's harmless, as long as you don't continue in that view. And the third is the divine beauty of those bearing the image of the heavenly. I think that's fantastic. The divine beauty of the, of the people, of you, who bear the image of Christ. This, to me, is, is community in heaven, communion. Now, all three notions are valid. Not one is preferred than the other. This is coming from St. Maximus. I'm not quite sure um, the implications of it. So how do we view heaven? I'm, that's a rhetorical question. I don't want an answer. But how do we view it? In order to prepare ourselves for the glory that is to come, and it's going to come, there's no doubt about that, we have to remember death. This is very much orthodox theology, is a remembrance of death, which is not morbid. It's not negative. And I give an example. Um, Mariam's going to be flying to um, Georgia on Sunday. Now, that's like she's preparing this week to go. That is a remembrance of death. Not literally, but but like an, an allegory, right? It's like that. We remember death because we're waiting to depart. Not a, a negative, mor morbid thing. If we think, you know, like um, we have to ask ourselves, are we prepared? Who's prepared for the next life? Are you prepared that you, in the next hour or tonight, that that will be your last night, that will be your departure? Are we prepared? So Maximus says it's like a, a ship, you know, a merchant has a ship, he prepares everything. Everything's ready, but he can't sail until he gets a favorable wind. And then as soon as there's a favorable wind, off you go. And this is how our life is on earth, is that we are preparing. I would say we were packing our spiritual suitcase with prayer, prechastia, holy communion, love for each other, and I repeat that, love for each other, that is packing our spiritual suitcase. So if we die in the next hour, we're ready. Ready to go to the next life. Remembrance of death is not morbid, but awareness, preparation for an eternal journey. This is St. Maximus. 
the ship is waiting for a fa favorable wind. And we must, we should be saying the prayer, you know the prayer before you go to sleep, my, is this bed going to be my tomb? It sounds terribly morbid, but it isn't, because it may be. We have to go in the tomb in order to rise again. You can't have resurrection without dying. So is, is this bed tonight, your bed tonight, going to be your tomb? During the night you part, you, you're called and off you go. You get on the ship or whatever it is, how, however you're going to travel, and you're in the next world. Everybody's very sad because we miss them, but this is actually, should be a, a glorious um, situation. Remembrance of death and the age to come help us overcome our fear of death. And I felt this very much over the last few months with this uh, COVID thing. Um, people are afraid. It's, it's a climate of fear. We're going to die. Oh, we're going to die. Yes, of course you are. <laughs> It's inevitable, yeah? Do we fear the virus? Do we fear death? No. That is why we can, can continue and not be uh, affected by this climate of fear, which is a part of the secular world, unfortunately also a part of the church, and some people in the church who have very little faith. So remembrance of death and the age to come help us overcome our fear of death it's called eschatological meditation. I put that in there, that term. Eschatology means the last things. It's Greek for end, end times. Actually, it's interesting because recently there's a lot of um, in, uh, activity on the internet about end times. A lot of Protestant sects are saying it's coming very soon and they're all getting ready. I think they have to have the rapture first and then they will have the, uh, what's after rapture? Then there will be the coming, you know, the, the second coming, judgment. They all miss out Antichrist. They don't think they've got their history worked out properly. They, if they read the Bible. Anyway, that, that's, but it's, it's a little bit alarming when I see this going on on the internet. Uh, and one, one person in particular has now got the ear of the president and he's being interviewed on CNN. Well, CNN doesn't, doesn't count, but, you know, but he's being interviewed on, on the internet. Um, heretic and, and believing that it's, it's going to come next week. The way he talks is going to happen next week. Well, we've been through all that before. I remember um, in, in the 50s, 60s, let's say, um, the, the end of the world, what they did, they set up a camera in Jerusalem and, and pointed it at, at the, at the gates. What, um, what's the term? What's it, what's it called? Golden Gate. Golden Gate, yes. They, they had a camera, they got ready to be able to film Christ coming again, his second coming. They got a tip off from somebody, but it turned out to be not a very good, good tip. I mean, in other words, people are always anticipating this. We anticipate it, but we anticipate the glory and the joy of heaven, and we're preparing ourselves. When it happens, it happens. I'm not saying that the, the Protestants who are promoting this are not happy because they, they, they want to be in the rapture. They, they, yeah, maybe they are happy, but I don't think, well, I don't know if the thinking's the same. What is rapture in this, hmm? what is rapture in this context? This is, we'll all be taken up to, into the clouds to meet Christ as he comes in judgment. And so they're all waiting to, and they say they'll be, I remember seeing signs on a car saying, uh, nobody here during the, it's a rapture and what was what was the quote do you remember Ken in case of rapture in case of rapture yeah car. yeah yes that's right <laughs> yes something like that Saint uh, Isaac the Syrian he's always in, in these talks of course quote the mind of a person in the age to come will be occupied with a contemplation of God's beauty future blessing for those who have united themselves with God and those who live in hope, like the Old Testament righteous. Now, I'm not sure about this. I, I don't really understand it. What, what St. Isaac is saying, that obviously the saints are prepared, but other people who hope and didn't quite get there, make it, as it were, were also into heaven. I hadn't thought about it. I hadn't come across this before. This is new to me, but I've been thinking about it in the last couple of days. And it means that each person, each one of you in heaven will see Christ and the level that you can have the capacity to see him. 
it'll be joyous. And, and St. Isaac says, because you may, may be a more advanced spiritually, he doesn't use those words, but if what he says, everybody is equal. Nobody is inferior. You will be able to see Christ with the eye, your spiritual eyes as much as you can put up the light, you know, capable of receiving the light. It, it's, uh, we were able to see God's beauty. I mean, what can, what can we say? I, I don't know what I'm talking I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just quoting St. Isaac, of course. He said, in heaven, various degrees of closeness to God. Of course, our minds, our carnal minds, mentally saying, oh, well, isn't you got to do this to get this level or something? Nothing to do with it. <laughs> you know, it's going to be a sort of score sheet. And if you score high, you get closer to God. I mean, you know. We can't help bringing in our, our you know, human fallen minds. Future blessings for those who have united themselves with God and those who live in hope, like the Old Testament righteous. They didn't see Christ, but they believed and were saved. They are our saints. They were not there. They were there before the resurrection, and they believed. The heaven, in heaven, various degrees of closeness to God, each according to the capacity for accommodating the light of the Godhead. Can we look upon God? How much can we do that? Depends on how we live here. How prepared we are, whether we've got our suitcase ready. However, no one is inferior to the other, he says. Many mansions, because there are many mansions in the kingdom of heaven. Maybe that's the answer. There are many mansions, so each one will have his own, and, but we're all joined together. It's not a isolation, although it couldn't possibly be isolation with God anyway. He fills everything, and we, and we will fill everything, and we will shine, and some people will, will, will be able to look at us, and some people probably won't. Now, I'm speculating, of course. I haven't got a clue what's going to happen. In heaven, various degrees of closeness to God, each according to his capacity. However, no one is inferior to the other. There are many mentions. So what about Gehenna? What about the opposite? And St. Isaac says that Gehenna, hell, is a person's inability, it's not a place, inability to, to participate in the love of God. That's terrible. And we do know that from an earthly experience, that we, we love somebody and then we do something wrong and we regret it. That, wow, I wish I hadn't done that. Something that you love. Sometimes it was a parent is difficult with children who are very naughty. You want to slaughter them. Um, but, you know, you have to have discipline. But it's a love, not being able to love. Can you imagine? I can't imagine that. Not being able to love. So it says that the, the sinners in, in Gehenna, in hell, are whipped with God's love. It's not a punishment. It's that you can't stand the light. 